Then he called on the radio a second time, and there was a little more um, anxiety and the sense of urgency in his voice. And that kind of alerted us to, hey, something else is going on. And then as soon as we stepped outside, we could hear um, chaos in the background coming from the consulate, which is only probably a quarter mile to a mile away. And welcome back to the Firearms Nation podcast. And I want to wish, again, everybody a happy 2023. Uh, I'm sure great things are going to happen for you. I'm hoping great things are going to happen for me. Uh, You know, the new year always brings out, you know, anticipation of of what's to come. So, uh, you know, stick with the show. Uh, I have reaching out to tons of different guests to bring on here. And... When I talk about the show, I'm also talking about the video show, because in 2023, I plan to keep all these shows video, and uh, that means up on YouTube. So if you haven't subscribed to the channel, Firearms Nation, please do. That way it helps with social proof, but it also uh, helps you get the content as soon as it comes out. And if you're the type of person that likes to listen to the show, well, you can always continue to subscribe to Firearms Nation podcast on Apple Podcast or whatever podcatcher that you use. That being said, the stuff out of the way, let's get into today's show. Uh, My guest today is, uh, there's two people, which will uh, actually be a first in the five years that I've done the show. Uh, The first is uh, Dave Benton, who was a guest uh, many, many years ago on the show. And at the time, uh, we kind of stayed away. If you don't know who Dave Benton is, he's he's Boone from 13 Hours, uh, which was a fantastic movie and a very interesting book. But uh, he's here today to talk about his new book that he wrote with his co-author, uh, Sarah Adams, who is a CIA targeter, which I had to look up to see what that was. And uh, it's explained in the book as well. But uh, that being said, uh, Dave, Sarah, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. And as you can see, this is the book here, uh, Benghazi, Know Thy Enemy. It's an uh, uh, interesting read, okay, because it's it's not just the 13 hours that we know. And if you haven't heard of Benghazi, and if you haven't uh, uh, seen the movie or picked up the book, uh, please, you can stop the podcast, go right to it, so you can watch it, so you can see what what uh, great Americans can do, and um, it's amazing. But uh, this book is is not just a, a retelling of what actually happened, but it's also uh, an investigation, and it it's a deep dive into the the vast network that was uh, perpetrated against the United States and and the consulate and against our ambassador. Uh, so. I, I had mentioned that, you know, Dave was in 13 Hours, or he was in Benghazi. Uh, he wasn't in the movie. Someone played him in the movie. But uh, what, uh, what, what is your, you, you were a Marine, and then you became a cop, and then you went into contracting. That's how you got to Benghazi. How did it go again? So, yeah, I was a Marine for about eight years, and I was in law enforcement for a few years. And then I ended up going to the State Department's Diplomatic Security Service, and helping them with the proof of concept, which was our high threat protection program. Um, I did that in a couple different places, Iraq, Afghanistan. And then I started rubbing elbows with some people from the agency and eventually ended up working for the Central, uh, Central Intelligence Agency with their global response team for about 12 years. Okay. And uh, so diplomatic security for people that don't know, that's like the secret service for the State Department personnel overseas and, and the high officials, correct? Or, or even diplomats that come here while they're visiting. Sure. The State Department, they um, do provide protection for dignitaries, both foreign and our, our own dignitaries. Um, they're also one of the few law enforcement, federal law enforcement agencies that is actually posted and has jurisdiction overseas. They're also responsible for uh, passport um, fraud as well. And what is the, the, for the people that don't know much about it, what is the CIA's global response team? So there's not a lot of information on the global response staff, um, and that's by design. A lot of it is classified, but in a nutshell, it's a full spectrum tactical support um, option 
available for case officers in high risk environments. Okay. And uh, so Sarah, how did you get, uh, or how did you become a CIA targeter? Yeah, I mean, I applied online to the CIA. I first applied to be an analyst because I didn't know much about the CIA and I thought that would be interesting. I realized my first couple of weeks, it was probably a really boring drop job. So then I got into targeting and I did targeting most of my career at the CIA. Okay, and what is a targeter? So <laughs> a targeter basically, their job is to, it's kind of like the find, fix, finish um, element of things. So you, you find someone, it's either a bad guy um, or you find um, a person that you might want to recruit for information. Then you fix them in a location, either to capture them or for someone to, you know, run into them and have a discussion with them. Um, and then you finish them either by obviously capturing a target or, you know, putting them in the X, as, you know, they like to say in our community. Or, you know, maybe a case officer goes in and is able to recruit the person. So, so we work on, you know, a lot of offensive and defensive stuff for the CIA. Okay, so when when you applied for the CIA, did, you know, why the CIA as opposed to like the FBI, the NSA, or any other uh, federal agency? Yeah, I mean, it was just the basic fact. I mean, remember, this is I'm a college student. I don't have a lot of knowledge. Um, so it was just the fact that I wrote a graduate thesis on Kashmir, and I couldn't think of anywhere else I could really work on um, Kashmir. So I applied to the CIA um, late one night. Um, I think that's what we do as college students. We just kind of like throw it out there and just take a shot at something. Okay, so so you're drinking. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> it's late one night, and and you're like, you know what? Uh, first of all, I don't even know, why were you writing about Kashmir? Long story short, it was like my first class and we had to pick a country and then I was going to pick Germany and someone picked Germany and then I ended up with Kashmir and then I kept it the next two years. I mean, again, college choices, um, you do what you do. But I did apply on Halloween. So so it was a night that there could have been alcohol involved. <laughs> <laughs> so you're applying, a uh, little tipsy, you apply to the CIA uh, you hit return, the application goes, and then they contact you. Now, for for a college kid, I mean, you're, you're going to the CIA. Uh, what were your expectations? Well, I thought I'd never get an interview, so I just thought I kind of like wasted a few hours on a Halloween night applying. So, um, yeah, during the process, I really never thought it was real until like the day I walked in. So it was June of, you know, the following year. Um, that I walked into headquarters. And then that's when it kind of struck me that, oh my gosh, how did I get in? I think they approved the wrong person. Like, I'm going to get kicked out of here kind of thing. Because, you know, you're just, you don't know what to think. I mean, I didn't even know anything about the CIA. I never knew anyone who worked in the CIA um, prior to applying. So it's it's a lot um, when, when you first walk in. Of course. Um, and everyone thinks that you're going to be an agent, but you didn't think you'd be an agent. That, that wasn't the track you were going for. No, I applied um, at the time for the analyst track, so it was in a different directorate. What made you choose to become a targeting, uh, a targeter? I just enjoy the operational side of the house at the CIA more, um, and I really hate writing, which is funny because I wrote a book. Um, but yeah, I just I really like doing the operations and. Um, when you do operations, you know, you actually get to effects faster. And it was just something I was really more interested in. Okay. Uh, so before you got to uh, Libya, what other assignments did you have? Or can you not talk about them? Yeah, I can say region. So um, I spent a, my first trip overseas was in Europe. And then I spent time in South Asia. Um, and then in a couple spots in the Middle East. And then in 2012 is when I went to North Africa. Okay. And in that time you were you were learning the the trade craft so to speak on on how to be a targeter? No, I was a full-blown targeter. I was actually the targeter um for the country um when I went in. Okay. Uh just side note, do do they teach you firearms and stuff like that to be a targeter? Yeah, well if you have to deploy to a dangerous spot overseas in a war zone, you will learn um different firearms, either firearms that would be issued to you or firearms that you might pick up, you know, in a crisis situation. And then you learn some things like driving, just different things that would be useful in those type of environments. 
she, she's actually very modest, but she actually maxed out the uh, pistol and carbine qualification course. And she was one of the best drivers there as well. So you're a, a, a targeter and they see that you've got these great skill sets. Uh, they weren't trying to push you to become an agent? Actually, yeah, I was offered a slot in, in, in this school that you would become a case officer in. Um, I want to say that was maybe 2009, probably beginning of 2010, and I actually turned it down. That would have been a six-month training, um, but I was offered a slot. Okay. Now, let's get back to Dave. Uh, so you're heading up uh, this training, and now you're deploying. How did you end up going to Benghazi? That was just one of my assignments. I mean, before then, I deployed all over the world, you know, for the agency. Um, that was just where they needed me at that time. So that's where I went. And you were, so obviously you, you, you got training in the, the Marine Corps. What what was your uh, MOS in the Marines? So originally I was the 03 um, Infantry, and then I was 0311, um, 8154, 8152, uh, several MOSs. But primarily most of my time was spent with the Scout Sniper Platoon and okay. then on a CQB platoon. And then when you uh, came back to the States, uh, I assume you were, you were working for a department in Florida in reserve capacity. Is that right? No, I was okay. actually in Georgia. So Georgia. yeah, certified deputy in Georgia. Um, and I was there full time for a while till 9-11 kicked off. Then I tried to get back into the military. Um, but the State Department actually contacted me before then. I was actually in the process of going back into the military. So I went the State Department route. And I continued to keep my law enforcement certification the entire time when I deployed. When I would come home, I go ride with the guys, mostly the drug guys, to keep my certification up. All right. So we're now at uh, it's September in 2012 in, in Libya. So for a lot of people, I don't know a lot of people, but I know me growing up, and I'm dating myself at this point. I remember Libya. I remember Gaddafi. I remember him having problems with Reagan, and I remember Reagan dropping uh, a bomb from an F-111 pretty close to him, trying to keep him in line, and it did for a while. Uh, but he was one of these guys, he was very flamboyant. I remember he had a whole personal security detail made up of solely women, right, um, <laughs> dressed up in, 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 in uh, these fancy uniforms, because he wanted, you know, he even looked like he was wearing makeup at times. Uh, he was a troublemaker, but he wasn't uh, he wasn't a devout uh, Muslim. He wasn't one of the Islamists who were, you know, coming after uh, America all over the world. This guy was more of for him, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct, Sarah? Yeah, he was basically anti-Islamist. He did fund terrorists, but they would be more like... Um, the terrorists in Ireland, the terrorists in Spain, for example, it wasn't actually like Al Qaeda type of terrorists. Right, because the back then a lot of the the who's who of the terrorist groups would come to these training camps, and and you know they would recruit up in 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 Europe, and then bring those people down here, and we had all these hijackings and and different types of attacks in in you know, synagogues and all these things around the world. Uh, it seems like the, the terrorism has kind of changed and shifted after 9-11. It kind of put Al-Qaeda up on top. Uh, everybody knew who they were then. Um, so let's just briefly talk about Qaddafi Libya versus post-Qaddafi Libya. So Qaddafi Libya, um, describe it for people who, who don't know what it was like uh, uh, being there and the lead up to how it kind of switched? Either yeah, way I mean, you can answer. I mean, Gaddafi Libya was, you know, I mean, he, he ruled as a dictator. Um, it was a form of socialism, though. So, like, the citizens got, like, monthly paychecks, if that makes sense. So th there wasn't actually, people weren't really employed as much full-time. So the really interesting part is a lot of people were, like, highly educated. I mean, I met someone with, like, three PhDs because they would just go to school all the time. Um, another thing is, is he 
favored different parts of the country and he favored different persons. So he favored the area around Tripoli, which is the capital. And then he um, like ignored the east of Libya. Um, he favored um, lighter skinned people. He mistreated a lot of the tribes. He obviously mistreated women. I mean, you talked about that women's security detail. I mean, he would rape those women. He would go and pick up school age girls from school and rape them during the day. Um, I mean, it was a pretty atrocious place to live if you weren't in his favored status, um, if that makes sense. So the citizens of Libya really just got fed up. Um, one of the key items though, is a bunch of terrorists started getting released due to um, different talks between the US government and the Gaddafi regime for us to take them off the terrorist list and open up. So terrorists started getting out over the years, starting around um, 2008, 2010 was another big release. And so the citizens were fed up. Now the trained terrorists were out of prison and they basically joined forces and then started a revolution to, to knock Gaddafi out of power. So, so what, for the time frame, what, what are we looking at right now where, where they're toppling uh, Gaddafi? They started in February of 2011, and then he died in October of 2011. So it was a pretty short revolution. So now there, there's a void, correct? And you know the, the top leadership is gone. Who's filling that void? What, what type of uh, factions are there? Yeah, so it's militias filling the void. Um, most militias, the more powerful ones, were the Islamist militias. So those are the ones that pull terrorists into their ranks. Um, there were some, though, that had power that did not want to be like an Islamic state type of thing. But it was pretty much militias. Um, the leaders of former terrorist groups, so the Libyan Islamic um, fighting group, it's called LAFG, it was one of the biggest terrorist groups in the country. They held a lot of power. A lot of the former terrorists got really involved into politics when the country kicked off. And then it was all those persons who Gaddafi had sent to exile. They came back to Libya during the revolution and fought, and then they became some of the senior leaders within the country. One of the problems that Libya had was during the revolution, um, their people weren't fighters. They didn't have a lot of people who served in the military. They didn't have access to weapons. So they had to use a lot of militias and terrorists. Um, once Gaddafi was after overthrown, these guys didn't want to give up power. So instead of integrating and become legitimate and becoming a legitimate military or security forces, they wanted their own role to where, hey, now they want an Islamic state. And these are... Uh Sunni Muslims, their Muslim Brotherhood, um, that faction, not not Hezbollah and the Iranians and stuff like that, correct? Yeah, correct. They're Sunni, so they don't really have um, many Shias at all. Um, and then there was a little bit of tribal stuff um, in Libya, but for most of it, we're talking about Sunni Muslims. All right. And how do you get drawn? We'll, we'll get to Dave in a second. So how do you get drawn into the country? So basically, I got asked to come out um, in January of 2012 because they wanted someone to start capture operations in the country and it had been very difficult to get going. And so they thought I could like steamroll the process and make it happen. And so that's what I was asked to come out and do, just kick them off. And and what about you, Dave? How did you get into the country and, and what time frame? Um, <clears throat> time frame, I believe, was around July. Um, yeah, actually, it was uh, July. And then again, it was just another assignment for me. I just came from another high threat environment where I was there for you know several months, and this was my turn to serve in Libya. So, if you can talk about what what when you're serving there, what what are you doing? Because you're not you're not a, a targeter. So, what what is your job in uh, uh, Libya? So again, like we said, GRS is like a full spectrum tactical support option. Um, so we run the gamut of a lot of different things but we're, we're providing a protective element to all operations. So we'll support the targeters, we'll support the case officers, anyone who is actually in the field conducting operations, we facilitate their operations. So as we lead up to September 11th, obviously in the book, it talks about how this uh, was a, a planned attack and multiple attacks. Uh, while you so you guys were both there around the same time how did you guys link up so we actually have a long history of working together as a team in other countries um just by happenstance we both ended up in benghazi and then obviously you know working together 
um, were working on the same operations. Um, it, it wasn't anything that was planned. It's just the way it worked out. And so what was going on in Benghazi around the time of September? What, what was the environment like? So the environment changed um, drastically from probably around April-ish, and then it started to increasingly get more um, violent. Um, again, normal, those are normal types of environments that we work in, but increasingly it was getting more violent. A big sign for us was when we saw the black flag. When we started seeing the black flag that was publicly flown, one, over the courthouse, which is very significant, and then two, in certain affluent neighborhoods where a lot of government officials lived, um, it was very concerning. There were several attacks on other um, countries as well, such as the Brits. Um, Red Crescent even pulled out. So we started to see increasing attacks. We had issues, um, not in the consulate, but outside, out in town as well, leading up to the actual attacks. So it was increasingly hostile environment. So to explain to the audience what the significance of the black flag is. So the black flag is the flag of um, terrorism, Al-Qaeda, basically. Um, and it, it's kind of like flying the Jolly Roger, you know, back in the old pirate days. When you saw the Jolly Roger, you knew things were bad. But it was openly being flown, so it showed us that Al-Qaeda was openly operating within the city without fear. So this is September uh in 2012, we that's uh, 11 years since the actual attack uh, in the United States. Wasn't this throwing up, I hate to use the same term, but wasn't this throwing up red flags around uh, the government that they're seeing this happen in uh, Libya? It should have. And it did for a lot of governments, like the Brits, they pulled out. Um, the French, they pulled out. Um, several other nations were pulling out. Um, we noticed it. Again, we operate in high threat environments. So it didn't really deter us. Do we make preparations for it? Absolutely. And when I say we, I'm talking about the, the agency themselves, the Central Intelligence Agency. Um, other government agencies like State Department, for whatever reason, they didn't take it as serious. Yeah. And another issue was um, a lot of the focus, especially from the U.S. policymakers, is how is the Libyan government going to be formed? How are the tribes influenced? How is oil and gas influenced? And those are the questions they were asking. So that's what CIA was answering on the ground. So they weren't actually collecting um, as well as they should have been against the terrorism threat. So they actually had a lot of black holes when it came to the terrorists um, in Libya. You also have to remember during that time, our administration pushed a narrative that, hey, Al Qaeda's done. They're on the run. We don't have to worry about that anymore. Where in fact, Al Qaeda was actually thriving right underneath our noses in Benghazi. Um, so we're now approaching September 11th, and Sarah, you actually leave before the attacks happen. How did how did that luckily happen for you? Yeah, I just had a scheduled um, meeting up in Europe, and so I flew up the morning of the attacks, and then I came back, obviously, after, but I went to the capital instead of into Benghazi. So I missed the entirety of the event. Did Were there any indicators that these attacks were about to happen? There weren't exactly indicators, but as he said, um, threats were increasing. There was attacks. The thing is, when you lived in Benghazi, there's assass you notice in the book, there's assassinations every single day, you know, most of the Libyans, but the, the crime factor is just, if it's, it's hard to explain what it's like to live in an environment when multiple things are happening every day. Even my trip to Europe was to discuss the terrorism in Eastern Libya and how it was getting out of control. So yeah, it's, we were just kind of in the middle of this chaos and every day it was just increasingly getting worse. You talk about indicators. Um, sure, there were indicators and then we made preparations for those indicators. For us, it was never a matter of if, it was a matter of when. But something we didn't have, we didn't have specific information that, hey, on this date, at this time, this group is going to conduct this operation. That's something we didn't have, but we definitely had indicators. So with all this going on, do you think it was a good idea for Ambassador Stevens to make a, 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 a trip to Benghazi? You, you can look at that two ways. Um, 
From a security perspective, no, it wasn't. From a policy perspective, yes, it was. And I'll let Sarah kind of get more in depth into that. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, they had the consulate staffed by a State Department person, right, at all times. He'd been trying to go out there for a couple months. Um, so this was just another time that there was an opening because the um, the person in the office was leaving, and so they needed to fill it for a week. So no matter what, they were going to send somebody from the Tripoli embassy to fill that spot. But there were two key items while Chris Stevens wanted to go. The first is they're opening like an American corner. It's kind of like a cultural institution, you know, kind of like a U, put, planting a little U.S. flag in Benghazi. That was important to Stevens because, like I told you earlier, Gaddafi ignored the East. So he wanted to tell Eastern Libya, uh, the U.S. government isn't going to do that. We're going to treat you the same as the West. And then the second thing is Hillary Clinton was planning to travel to Benghazi in October. So Chris wanted to get out there prior to her visit to get his ducks in a row because one of the key items he was asking her for is a new consulate that would um, co-locate the State Department and the CIA to help obviously improve the safety and security of the State Department personnel because they would be with CIA who had better security. So he actually did have um, some real goals to be there at that time. So Dave, uh, with your experience, you know, when we're talking this area, there, there's the consulate where uh, uh, the ambassador was, and then there was the annex where, I guess, CIA, oper CIA operations were, were being held. Were they defensible positions? Would, did you feel that <clears throat> they're good places? So, that, um, okay, go ahead. They, they were definitely defensible. Um, ours was defended, and we had prior preparations to defend it. Uh, the State Department facility could have been defended if it was given the proper security requested, which was denied several times. Yeah, and one thing our book, though, does show, this was an attack of 150 well-trained terrorists. They fought in Afghanistan. They fought in Iraq. They fought in the Algerian Civil War, where over 200,000 people were killed. So this weren't some ragtag guys who've never been in a fight before. So it was a pretty formidable force that went up, and it would be difficult pretty much for any consulate that we have to take on an al-Qaeda attack of that magnitude. Nobody ever has. So we don't know how you know a well um, established and well secured one would do actually that that's a good point um you know to, to answer it you know could it be defended yes but like sarah's saying for how long you know even the annex it was getting to the point to where um we couldn't go much longer especially if we were hit by you know the, the full force of of the attacking assault element so yeah that was one of the things that they said in the 9 11 commission was that there was a lack of imagination in, in the preparation for it. Um, so the attack in Benghazi, so one of the things I didn't know, and I got in the book, is that it came all the way from um, Ayman al-Zawahiri, who was, he was what, originally from the Muslim Brotherhood, who then went on to become, you know, the number one guy in uh, uh, Al-Qaeda until his demise this past year, or last year, because we're now in 2023. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's pretty shocking. That that means this this came all the way from the top of Al Qaeda. Exactly, and that goes against the narrative that the administration pushed, and unfortunately, what the FBI pushed as well with Abu Qatala and then Ansar al Sharia. So explain before we get into the actual attack. Explain to who those those two because you mentioned them a lot in the book. Who who those two people were? So yeah, basically. Um, Abu Qatala was a terrorist that was captured by our FBI, and he was tried in the United States for being the mastermind of the attacks. And he's serving 22 years in U.S. prison when he wasn't the mastermind and he wasn't even an attacker. So it was just um, low-hanging fruit to um, enable a narrative. Um, the other group he talks about is called Ansar al-Sharia. They're a local group based in Benghazi. They were founded in 2012, so a new group, but they were run by a guy that knew bin Laden back during the Sudan era. So when al-Qaeda wanted to do the attack in Benghazi, they reached out to this new group um, because they had historic relations with some of the senior leaders and said, hey, you know, will you give us bodies for our attack? 
And so they're one of the local groups who provide a terrorist. The really interesting thing with that group, though, you could be a member of Al-Qaeda and you could be a member of Ansar al-Sharia because it was an umbrella organization. So a lot of people don't actually understand that in the U.S. government to this day. I mean, they really don't understand Libyan terrorism, but that's kind of how it worked. It was just a longtime brotherhood of fighters that all got together that night to support the Al-Qaeda attack. And when it comes to Abu Qatala, um, he's a bad dude. Like, he should be in prison, just not for the Benghazi attacks. And, and the association was he was low-hanging fruit. He was there, but he was there after the fact. He never stepped foot into the consulate until the real attackers, Al-Qaeda, actually left. Um, he was never tried for murder. He was Well, he was tried for murder. He wasn't convicted of murder. He was convicted for material support, which he did not provide, and then looting. And that's what he's doing 18 years for. Again, he should be imprisoned, just not for that. The only association was a few members of his group, which was defunct when the attacks happened, actually participated in the attack. And that's the only real link. Other than that, he had nothing to do with it. So the night of uh, September 11th, uh, Dave, you were there. What what was your first alert that, that things were going wrong, that things were going bad? Call over the radio. Um, call over the radio, radio from the team leader to report to um, the team room. That was the first indication that something was wrong. Um, lackadaisically, we started moving that way, myself and Tonto, because we were actually on QRF that night. We still had operations going on, so we still had a team out. Um, so we just moved over there. We thought that he was going to brief us on what was going on in Egypt because we had the protests going on in Egypt, and that's what we thought it was about. Then he called on the radio a second time, and there was a little more um, anxiety and the sense of urgency in his voice. And that kind of alerted us to, hey, something else is going on. And then as soon as we stepped outside, we could hear um, chaos in the background coming from the consulate, which is only probably a quarter mile to a mile away. So you guys gear up and you head over there. They have DSS already on scene, but they're overwhelmed at this point, correct? Correct. Yeah, the DSS was co-located. That's where they lived. Um, they were definitely overwhelmed initially. Um, later on that night, once they went back to the annex, they were actually in support of us and, and did very well the rest of the night. So from the movie, you can, if you watch it, uh, they, they set fire to the ambassador's residence and uh, what happened with the ambassador? What, what was the final result with that? So they actually set fire to another building where the QRF, the local QRF, and then the local guard force lived. Then they set fire to the ambassador's residence. Ultimately, what happened, um, the DSS agent was attempting to secure Sean Smith and Ambassador Stevens. At some point, um, fire was set and it became very unlivable for them to be in there to where they had to escape. Um, Ambassador Stevens and Sean Smith were both lost in the smoke, which was literally pitch black. Um, the DSS agent was able to make it out through one of the windows. We were able to recover Sean Smith, who died of smoke inhalation. We were not able to find Ambassador Stevens, but he actually did die of smoke inhalation. He was not violated by extremists. He was not found by extremists. He was actually found by supporters in the neighborhood who thought he was alive, but he wasn't, unfortunately. So there's that, that picture of him being dragged. Those, those were people who are actually supportive of, of the United States trying to help him. Because, I mean, you could, from a picture, you can't tell. Just like a text message, you can't tell the intent. You can't tell from that picture what's going on there. So the, he was being taken to a hospital. Is that what that was? Yes, he, he was. But during that picture, unfortunately, he was deceased. But he was actually found by people who actually supported him himself, not just the United States. And that's not a picture. That's actually a video. And and we've seen the video and we talked to the gentleman that was kind of holding under his armpits. So, yeah, it was um, well after the attack. This is, um, you know, after one in the morning, all the attackers had well left the compound. So it was um locals looking around and then somebody found him on the floor in one of the rooms came out asked for help and then then you're seeing the gentleman who came in and helped carry his body out to bring to a hospital 
And they cheer because they think he's actually alive. That's why they are cheering where a lot of people take out a context and they think they're cheering because he's deceased. And that's not the case. Yeah. Right now, the first time I'm ever hearing that. So I've never, you know, and I, I watched news and studied this, never heard that story until read your book and talked to you tonight. So, uh, thank you for clearing that up. Um, so that's done, and then they're going to start attacking the annex. So they obviously knew that the CIA was there for a while because uh, they attacked it. Um, did you guys notice probing of the, of the facility at any time beforehand? So not beforehand, but what we did notice, once we actually made it back to the annex after doing an SDR to make sure we weren't followed back, um, we did see a convoy of vehicles drive past our main road, which led to the annex. And then they immediately turned around and came back. And that was the first indication that, hey, you know, someone else is here, um, however they got there. Um, and now we might have to deal with this. So we did an SDR to make sure we weren't followed. State Department may have been followed, but it really doesn't matter because everyone kind of knew where the Americans were anyway. So whether we had the um, super secret honeycomb hideout it wasn't really a secret. If you lived in the city, you know where both of the Americans lived. Yeah, and when we identified the mastermind of the mortar strike on the annex, he knew exactly where we we lived. He didn't have to follow anyone that night or do anything like that. He knew how many Americans were in country, where we lived, um, everything about us. Um, he actually had a relationship with us. So um, th th this isn't some outsider trying to like probe around to hunt the Americans down. So Dave, so now we're we're at the attack on on the annex, and I mean it's it's almost like the Alamo. I hate to to make that kind of comparison, but that's what it, it seems like. You know, you are surrounded by these hostile people. You're not getting any support. You got to hold them as long as possible. Uh, can you just quickly get into the mindset of, of what you were thinking at that time? Yeah, um, just thinking about accomplishing the mission. Um, again, you know, prior planning prevents poor performance. Fortunately, we did all the homework ahead of time. You know, we had lanes of fire set up. We had um, reinforced positions set up. We had the equipment we needed. We had the ammo we needed. Um, we had the training that we needed. And we also rehearsed these things prior, not because we anticipated this happening. It's just that's what you do. You plan for contingencies. And this was one possible contingency. So on the annex side, we were actually very well prepared um, to deal with situations like this. It's just how long, how long could we keep it up? Um, especially against a numerically superior force, which they were. So in the movie, it seems like there's three attacks. Was, was that similar to what happened or was it a continuous thing without any rest in between? No, there, there were um, three-ish continuous attacks and then the mortar attack. I say three-ish because one was an initial attack, um, and then the second attack was probably the um, most intense, where it was very heavy. There was a very, very brief lull where it never really stopped, and then it continued again. So if you include that as one in total, there was three attacks that night at the annex. How did it feel when you guys asked for help and, and nobody was coming to help you guys? So there's a lot that we know from hindsight. You know, there's a lot that we just didn't know at that time. Um, hence, if you read the book 13 Hours, you'll get a slightly different perspective. If you got all of us together and talked to us now with the information we had, 13 Hours would have been a different book. Um, at the time, though, we didn't have all the information. We really didn't know what was going on or why. But it was a little disheartening that we didn't get support right away. In hindsight, actually, after actually knowing why we didn't get um, hindsight or, or why we didn't get support, um, it's it's heartbreaking, honestly, to where, you know, I really lost faith in my government. Love my country, but really lost faith in my government. So after the attack and uh, you come back, Sarah, what, what is your function at this point? 
Uh, well, what I made my function to be is to try to find out who the attackers are. Um, it was a really awkward situation. Um, you know, I was in Tripoli, which was our station, and they actually didn't want the Benghazi people to be there. So, so it was very strange at first. We had to set up like our own computer network because they didn't put us on theirs. Um, it was a really odd environment. So really what I focused on is um, collecting information on the attackers, going to any of the meetings with assets who had any information, and then like writing up their reports to send out. Now, before you come back, are, are you watching the news where Susan Rice gets on 16 different networks at the same time, all talking about a video? Are, are you seeing that ahead of time or did you find out about that afterwards? Yeah, I actually saw that in real time. The really interesting part is, you know, I'm, I'm now in Tripoli. And luckily, our, our chief of station at the time didn't believe the video narrative as well. So he was actually writing dissents to all the CIA reports talking about a video saying, um, you know, Tripoli station, you know, in Libya does not concur with this. Oddly, his his dissents weren't getting shared, right, which is interesting because that's the point of dissenting. Um, so we were holding pretty firm on the ground. There was no video narrative. But then a week later, when we actually got the surveillance photos and videos and proved it, I actually reached back out to CIA headquarters and I informed, you know, one of the senior analysts writing those reports. And I said, hey, I watched the entire video. There's no protest. And they actually said, we're not changing the assessment until we receive the video in hand ourselves. And then, as you know, they never changed the assessment. So they they never intended to change the assessment, even with, um, you know, evidence to the contrary. Just for reference, too. So um, Sarah was there that morning and that's when she flew out. The next day she came back, but she came back to Tripoli. So it's not like she was gone for a week. It was just a, a um, quick trip. And then she was right back. It's got to be so interesting to think, you know, they are running away from this. It is a great narrative of you guys doing your best to to rescue the ambassador, to, to hold the annex, to do all these things. I mean, that that is, I can't think of anything more American and, and professional from you guys. And they ran so far away from that and was, it, it was insulting to, to, to a lot of Americans that I know, how, how the administration and, and, and how the Secretary of State at the time, I think that was Hillary, uh, just didn't care. Um, I hope that didn't affect you too bad. No, um, again, we didn't have high expectations of, of that particular administration anyway. The problem with Benghazi, though, is it's turned into like a taboo, you know, almost a conspiracy theory, which is very sad. Because it is a very important subject, and although it was tragic, there was a lot of good that happened that night, you know, in, in um, the next morning. But it was never a conspiracy until they made it a conspiracy. There was really nothing to hide. Um, the problem started to become a problem, as you said, when they started getting on talk shows and changing the narrative. Instead of just coming out and saying, hey, this is what happened, this is what we know, this is what we don't know. They started spinning the story and using it for political reasons, both sides. And that's when it became a conspiracy. So in the book, you really break down all the people who, I mean, it's, it's like, uh, you know, all the president's men, if, again, I'm dating myself, if, if you know the story of Watergate, how, <clears throat> how all the different people function in it. And it is a, a, it says it's a cold case investigation on the title. And it, it is, uh, describe what are you trying to do with this book? Why, why are you going in depth with all the different people who are still out there who are involved in this uh, attack? So we didn't write a book to, you know, sell a book. We took a part of our open source investigation and put it in book form so we could share it with the public. We want to share it with the public so we can spread the word and um, raise awareness so people can contact the representatives and make sure something's done. A lot of these terrorists are still active. Um, when you read the book, you'll see, like, um, um, <clears throat> sorry, um, like Sarah was saying, a lot of these guys were involved before the first 9-11, after 9-11. They were involved in London. They were involved in uh, France, Charlie Hebdo, um, they're, the Enemenus attacks. They're still out there committing acts of terrorism because we failed to go after them. 
A lot of them need to be red listed. A lot of them need to be on put on a no fly list. Um, a lot of them need to be found and brought to justice. There are some that we already have that are incarcerated. We need access to them so we can debrief them. This is still an active threat. And it's not just a threat from Libya. It's an international threat. Right now, we're concerned about the border, and we should be. We have problems on the border. But a lot of these terrorists can get on a regular flight, fly over here, because they're not on anyone's radar. So we need to bring awareness so we can identify these people, put them on a list, and then actually bring them to justice. Now, when you're saying we, are you talking about you and Sarah, or are you working with a team, or are you talking about the government? When you say we, who are you saying? So when we say we, we mean everyone. Um, whether it's our government, whether it's a foreign government, definitely myself and, uh, and Sarah, we're not going to rest and allow them to slip through the cracks. It is an ongoing investigation and we're not done yet. Yeah. And that's why we made it open source. Obviously, we could have tried to work and get some task force in the U.S. government, even though Benghazi is um, taboo. But if we make it completely unclassified, then the Algerians can look into these guys. The French can look into these guys. Um, you know, the Egyptians can look into these guys, the Emiratis, like it doesn't matter. Now they all know, hey, here's the terrorists. We need to put them on our watch list or, oh, wow, they did these other crimes against our people. Now, we can charge them for it. And so that was a focus of the book. And that's why those profiles are written the way they are. It's it's for those intelligence professionals to grab the one bio and be like, hey, we care about this one guy. Let's do something about him. Has there been any takers so far since you released the book from any governments? Yeah, well, we've had some luck. We've actually had, um, we've made some photo lineups and our photos have been shown to detainees um, in different custody. We actually had another situation where um, somebody thought they found one of the attackers in their country and they actually reported that to, to the, the military in their country. Um, we actually, another one of the attackers in the book, we had him at large and we've now been able to confirm that he he's detained um, and we passed that off to another government who actually can try try him and charge him for crimes. He could probably get the death penalty even in that country. So we've actually had um, a little bit of success since October, and we're just hoping that snowballs into a, more success, obviously. So where are we right now? If, if you look back at history, and you should always look back at history, uh, are we pre-9-11? Do you see the same type of stuff out there? I mean, we, we gave up Afghanistan. We gave it up to the Taliban because they're such great people and they're not going to go back to anything they've done before. Um, is Are we setting ourselves up for failure because we, we have a border that anyone can slip through? Uh, we're using air marshals uh, at the border as opposed to being on planes. I mean, are, are, are we should we be worried about what's what's going on? We should definitely be worried because we're ignoring the problem um, like you alluded to. You know, Afghanistan, Afghanistan is going back to the way it was right after the Mujahideen. You know, we're creating that breeding ground for more terrorists, Um, just like we did with Libya and Benghazi and Derna. You know, we allowed them to grow right underneath our noses and we didn't pay attention to it. The exact same thing is happening in Afghanistan right now. And I'll let Sarah get into it um, in a little more detail. But even in Afghanistan, the Taliban is issuing actual... um, passports and visas to any terrorist who wants one. So again, they can legally fly over here underneath the radar. They don't even have to sneak through the border. So we're definitely setting ourselves up for failure. Yeah, and we noted that in our book, you know, the Libyan government had provided passports to terrorists at our attacks. I mean, if you had gotten to one of the German terrorists, he even reported, oh, the Libyan government gave me a Libyan uh, Libyan passport, right? So Afghanistan is giving like let's say a Pakistani terrorist, an Afghan passport, and they're getting into refugee pipelines. Um, It's super dangerous. The other thing is, is, um, you know, in Afghanistan right now, there's 27 international terrorist groups operating, 27. So people focus on, oh, they're fighting in Afghanistan. It's like, well, you guys are like losing your minds. Like terrorists are going again to train in Afghanistan. We just had an attack in New York City and the attacker wanted to travel to train in Afghanistan. That's where everybody wants to go again now. Um, You know, we're not the time around 9-11. We are so beyond that with our threat environment now. The number of terrorists um, so surpasses 9-11. I mean, in Afghanistan alone, 15,000 
thousand men were released from prison. In Libya, there was only 600 terrorists in prison. And look at 150 guys, um, you know, stormed our consulate. I mean, Afghanistan is 10 times the size of that. There was terrorists from all over the world in those prisons. So, so we're in a really dangerous environment. If you think about it, some of those guys have been in prison 20 years. They're, they're not going to go and retire. We even show in our book, um, the, a lot of the attackers in our book were detained, right? They all went back to terrorism. We only have one attacker in our book that we think reintegrated back into society out of 150. I mean, that's pretty scary. I mean, that means nobody does. So in Afghanistan, um, in the Muslim culture as well, they play the long game, right? We as Americans, we were very into the instant culture. Um, I remember years ago, I saw a map that they were looking at, you know, right now, how many countries are Muslim to in a hundred years where it's the whole planet. Uh, and I'm not trying to be, you know, anti-Muslim or anything. We're, we're talking about the, the specific, uh, you know, whatever, five to 10% who are, are radical, who want to, you know, hurt and kill people. That's what we're talking about. And if you're, you know, 5% or 10% of, uh, you know, what is it, a billion people, that's a lot of people uh, that, you know, we we have a country there that they're free now to do whatever they want. You know, the Russians were there, they left. Now the Americans were there, they waited them out, they're, you know, they got the country back. So it is a scary uh, situation. Uh, since you've written this book, and come out and, and, and started putting yourself out there, have you guys felt any pressure or any threats against you? <clears throat> no, not, not yet. Um, obviously, there's always the, the threat of, you know, um, terrorism. But as far as like from um, any government entities or anything like that, no. And in the book, um, we, we did submit it to the review board for the agency and Department of Defense as well. So we haven't gotten any backlash from anyone on our side yet, but there's always a threat, you know, of some bad guy or some terrorist or just someone who's crazy, but no, nothing specific, no. Yeah, the bigger issues we have is, you know, when you've worked for CIA and now people think our book is political because they haven't read it right. So we, we have actually gotten threats from Americans um, for putting out a, a, another book on Benghazi, um, so to say. But the good thing with, with the terrorists, at least none of the Libyan terrorists, um, luckily right now, are in the U.S. And that's really because of the travel ban. You know, Libya was in included in the long um, travel ban that um, Trump had instituted. And that travel ban, a lot of people don't understand, it was instituted in the countries where they don't actually have um, like background check information. So, you know, I spent many years working Pakistan, I, mean, I spent many years working Libya, they both have pretty much the same amount of terrorist groups, Pakistan probably has more. Pakistan wasn't included in the travel ban because they have, you know, legitimate institutions, Everybody has kind of like a social security number. Um, you know, the U.S. government can ask for a background check on, on this person and the Pakistanis will provide it. That wasn't available in Libya. Libya didn't even have social security numbers. There was no way to identify the people in that country. And as, as you learn in our book, they also were issuing passports to terrorists. You, you couldn't take the risk. Um, and a lot of people need to understand that when, when they just listen to people in the news telling you um, why things are being put into place. You need to actually like pull back the layers and understand why things are happening. And it is to protect our homeland. So I'm, I'm pretty lucky. I heard that President Biden listens to this show. And since he is listening, uh, what would you want to tell him uh, that we should be doing right now? Um, well, I think a key thing is, and it's so basic, and it actually, I, I almost am embarrassed asking, it's just watch list the terrorists. Watch list the terrorists in our book. Watch list the terrorists that were detained in Afghanistan and now free. Um, for years, right, like we were in Afghanistan, we have fingerprints and this and that. Put them in our databases. Like if they're crossing a border, we should know that they're a terrorist the second somebody runs their prints. Like we're, we want the most basic things done by our government and like they can't do it. And it's scary because like you say, it's been all these years since 9-11 and we're worse at counterterrorism than when we started. Yeah, I'd say, you know, um, have someone read the book to him so he actually knows what's in the book. 
um, and then just act. You know, if the two of us can gather all this information using open source, um, imagine what our government could actually do if they wanted to. They're definitely capable of it if they want to. So just act. So like Sarah said, so we can actually watch list these people and or put them on the X. So Dave, you're you're uh, a trainer, right? You teach firearm classes. I follow you on Instagram. I see all the stuff you're doing. Uh, is that is that primarily what your your full time gig is? Yes, that actually keeps me very busy. <laughs> and uh, you're you're offering classes around the country, or do people need to to come to your range, or how's it work? No, we offer classes all around the country. If anyone's interested, um, they can look up my name or Threat Management Solutions on shootingclasses.com, and they'll find something. And and Sarah, you're uh, you're going to become a, a full time author. Is that the plan? Oh, no, thank you. Um, so I work for the Department of Defense. I work on research and development. And then I spend a lot of my free time, pretty much all of my free time, if you ask Boone, because I never have time for Libya anymore, um, working on Ukrainian issues and then rescuing people from Afghanistan. So yeah, that's that that kind of is like a full-time job. All right, that that's good. Um, and that could be a whole other show another time, because that sounds fascinating. Uh, but I, I, I want to encourage people to go out and get uh, Benghazi Know Thy Enemy and uh, pick it up, not only to support Dave and Sarah, but uh, to support our country, to support our heroes, and, and to continue uh, your understanding of what happened. Um, and I want to thank both Dave and Sarah for uh, coming on the show today to talk about their book and their insights into what happened in Benghazi. Yeah, thanks for having thank us. Thank you for having us, definitely. My pleasure.